All right, now the part of the chapter I want to focus in on in Colossians chapter 1 starts at verse number 9 where the Bible reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So what their prayer was, they said, we don't cease to pray for you, the people at Colossae, the church at Colossae, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. He's saying, we're praying that you would know, that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will for you in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. The purpose of, of you knowing God's will is so that you can walk worthy of the Lord unto all, pre, all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness. And what I'm preaching about this morning is knowing God's will. Oftentimes, and, and I, I think we're filled in a room of people that love God, right? People here, they love God, and what we want to do, we want to do what's pleasing in God's sight. We want to know, what is God's will for my life? What does God really want me to do? And this is, and, and you know, a lot of times these days, there's kind of a mysticism around that. And, and there's a lot of false teachings about this, and people have a tendency to, to try to, equate a warm and fuzzy feeling with God's will and we need to be able to separate the emotion and the feeling from what God's will actually is because sometimes when you're doing what's right you may be having a great feeling inside and, and it may lift your spirit and 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 you know you feel wonderful but other times you can completely be doing God's will and maybe have a pit in your stomach and, and things just, you don't feel that great. We can't let the emotion validate whether what we're doing or what we should do is according to God's will. Because oftentimes doing the right thing, doing the, the will of God can be something that can cause you to maybe be nervous or afraid or you know, you're putting yourself out there for, you know, to be attacked. So those types of feelings that go along with that aren't going to be very pleasant. So we can't say, well, this must not be God's will because this doesn't feel right to me. Okay? And, and unfortunately, there is a lot of that type of teaching that goes on. And, you know, for example, the, um, when, I, when I go out, so when I talk to Mormons, you know, I, I try, to, I try to, to preach them the gospel. I'm trying to show them, you know, a, 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 the truth about the Bible and about Jesus Christ. And... They all claim when they how do you know how do you know for sure that you're saved when they say how do you know they all go back to this experience that they've had. Well, I had this experience. See, I asked God, is the Book of Mormon true? And then He gave me this overwhelming feeling that, that verified that yes, this is in fact the Word of God. And you talk to them, I'm not lying. I mean, they just about every single one, and, and the only reason I'm saying just about is because I don't always go into that subject with every single Mormon. But all of the ones I've ever gone into that subject about is how do you know the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and that it's not a false book, it's not from a false teacher and stuff. They all say, well, I've asked God and He promises that He'll give me knowledge and I've had just a good feeling about it. And... That is something you do not want to base your decisions on, what's right and what's wrong, based on a feeling. The Bible says the heart is wicked. Okay, we're, we're born with a wicked heart. We have a sinful nature. So sometimes, hey, sometimes committing sin feels good. I mean, that's why people do it, isn't it? When, when I, I remember when, when I used to go out and you know, drink some alcohol, hey, that made my body feel good. That's one of the, that's the reason why you even do it, right? There's, there's different reasons for getting into sin. But you know what? It's sin. It's wrong. It's not the right thing. So regardless of how it makes you feel, it's not right. Now, putting aside the emotional aspect of it, because we have to just completely separate that, we can know God's will. And first of all, I just want to point out for God's will, God's will, first and foremost, is that everybody would be saved. Yeah. And when we say will... It's just another word for want. It's like kind of like an older, older word, but 
Basically, it's what God wants. What does God want? That's what God's will is. And you think of like a, your last will and testimony, it's, it's you're writing down in words what you want to happen after you're gone. Say, this is my wishes. This is what I want. That's what a will is. So we're looking at God's will. And you don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm just going to read for you from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, get this, not willing that any should perish. It is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not a, a Calvinistic God that picks and chooses certain people to be saved and certain people to, to be damned just based on His sovereign will. People believe this. People will tell you, no, God, it's, it's His will. You know, who are we to question God's will? And if God decides that I, He wants this person to go to hell and He wants this person to be saved, so be it. That's God's will. That is a heretical false teaching. Yeah. Because we can see from Scripture, I quoted it to you, but 2 Peter 3.9 says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want people to die and go to hell. He created hell for, for the devil and his angels. That's why he made it, but he's a just God. Now, he doesn't want people to go there, but it does happen, okay? People, people will go there when they don't accept Christ as their Savior. But that's not what God wants. That's not what he desires. And he doesn't force his will on us because he's given us a will of our own. He's given us a free will, a will that says he, he's allowed us the capacity of making our own decisions and saying, I choose to follow the Lord or I choose not to. I could choose to do whatever I want. Now, it doesn't mean there's no consequences, but we have that will. We have that desire. It's a gift that's been given to us by God. It's what makes us extremely unique. We're not puppets. We're not robots. We are individuals that God has given us a will and a, and a sense of being able to determine for ourselves what we want to do. And He lets us do that. God doesn't want anyone to go to heaven, but he doesn't force people to either. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, if you're not saved, you're not going to really know what God's will is because the way that we know these things is through the Spirit. Okay, the Spirit's going to lead us and guide us into all truth and wisdom. That's why we have the Holy Ghost that indwells us today. And that's what it's saying here. He's saying, look, you know, the Spirit of, of God, uh, or, um, excuse me, let me read it again. Um, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. The things of God, what God wants for us, that is revealed to us by the Spirit of God. And this is the most shaky, I guess you could say, or, or um, that, that I'm going to get in this sermon today, because as soon as you introduce something like the Holy Ghost, people start to think, oh, well, the Holy Ghost is telling me to do this, and it's telling you to do that, and they're teaching, well, you know, that may be wrong for you, but I'm not being convicted by that. Another false teaching that's going on around today. And just because there is a Holy Spirit that guides us in all truth, doesn't mean that you can just abuse that and say, well, He's telling me that drinking's just fine. He's telling me that committing whatever is just fine. I'm not being convicted by that. It's no big deal. No. The truth is the truth is the truth no matter what. Okay? And God's truth is revealed to us in His Word. So if you're saying that you have this Holy Ghost that's telling you that something is okay, if it contradicts God's Word, that ain't the Holy Ghost telling you that. That's your own heart. That's your own imagination just coming up with whatever it is you want to justify to yourself as being okay. And quite honestly, hopefully by the time I'm done with this sermon, you'll see that 
God's will isn't that complicated. It isn't that difficult. There really isn't a lot of mysticism about it. What happens is we often have a tendency to complicate things more than they need to be. Now, oftentimes it's, it's, it's because you, you really want to do what's right and you're trying to be very careful and there's nothing wrong with that. You, you ought, we ought to try to be careful. But sometimes it's also because you want to just be able to justify whatever it is that you're doing, that you don't want to change about yourself, that you don't want to you know, get in line with God's word. So there's <laughs> the, the world is full of people that want to just, instead of being interested in exactly what God wants, they let their own desires kind of trump what God's saying because they really don't want to change. Because we have some, oftentimes a rebellious uh, uh, spirit about us that, that says, eh, I, don't want to, I don't want to change that about me. But we ought not to have that. Um, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 13 because there's something that's very critical to, to explain um, about why things aren't that difficult. Verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. See, the, the, the unsaved man might mock or laugh at the things that you consider to be, hey, no, this is God's will. We need to do this. We need to do that. You know, people will, will laugh at us for the way that we dress or for not watching TV. I was talking to, to Brother uh, Rodriguez about, um, he, said he was having a conversation with ladies. He, he just mentioned like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't watch TV. And he was just kind of like blown away. Like, what? You don't watch TV? You know, like, like to the world, something like that is just completely off the wall. It's just like, how could you not, you know, like, you don't even, you, 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 say, you didn't even know what TV show she was talking about or something. You're just like, I've never heard of it. I don't know what you're talking about. And she's like, how could you not have heard about this TV show? What do you mean? Like, this, you know, and, and it, it might be a silly example, but those are the types of things where, you know, we will, will take stands that other people want to, you know, on, on, on modesty and on the way we communicate, the language that we use, all different types of things that this world sees no problem with some of this stuff. Whereas we say, no, the Bible tells us we have a high standard that we need to live up to and we're going to attempt to live up to the standard as best as possible. You might think it's foolish, but it's because you don't understand because you don't have the spirit of God because you don't understand what God's will is for your life. But let's keep reading here. Verse 15 says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And see, this is a very powerful statement. We have the mind of Christ. So if we want to know what God's will is, what's Jesus' will in my life? Hey, we have his mind. We have the mind of Christ. For one, we have the Holy Ghost inside of us that's going to be leading us and guiding us. But for two, number two, we have his words. We have the instructions for our life written down in black and white in the pages of the Holy Bible. These are our instructions. What is God's will for your life? Do you have to pray every day? And see, this is, this is where a lot of people think like, Oh, well, I just need to, you need to keep praying every day, which there's nothing wrong with praying, so don't get me wrong on that. Pray every day and then wait for some voice to hear from you. God's not going to speak to you audibly. And again, there's a lot of people out there that believe this. They'll say, you know, I'm, I need to hear from the Lord. Because what they do, what, what, the reason why a lot of people believe this, they'll say, look, well, look at the people in the Bible. God spoke to them. And is that true? Absolutely. Did God speak to Moses? Yes. Did God speak to Samuel? Yes. Did God, you know, I mean, go on and on down the list. Did God speak to a lot of these people? Yes, he did. He was revealing his word unto these people. And guess what? The reason why we know that is because it is God's word, because it is in the Bible. I mean, this is, these are God's word. These things that God, when God was speaking to people, they are written down in, the whole, in his holy Bible. Because God was speaking. I've heard people say, literally, I've heard more than one person say this. Because, you know, when you get into conversation about salvation, you, you, know, you get into a lot of how do you know X or Y. How do you know you're saved? How do you know whatever? And, and you, you get into these conversations. And I've heard people say, well, I've heard God speak to me. And they say, I was all alone. I was praying. I was quiet. And a still, small voice spoke. 
And again, where they, where they get that from? They get that from the Bible. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19 in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 19. We're going to see the reference to this because what, what happens is, is people, they'll think because, oh, it was a still small voice and that was in the Bible, so that must be God because that's what God, you know, and, and they kind of tie these things together. Now, I don't always doubt that people actually have heard a voice. Sometimes maybe they're just lying or they imagined it, but we live in a world of physical and spiritual. Okay, I believe the Bible. I believe that there are angels. I believe that there are devils. I believe that there is spiritual warfare going on that our eyes cannot perceive in this lifetime on this earth. But I believe it exists. Just like a lot of the, the mediums and, and the, 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 you know, the, these people that... that um, Psychics and fortune tellers, you know, and this type of thing. There's a lot of charlatans out there that are just trying to make a buck. But there are a lot of people, I believe, that are doing things that they ought not to. The Bible says not to, you know, consult with familiar spirits and all this other stuff. That it's wickedness and, and the witchcraft is, is, is a really wicked sin. But I believe it's real. I believe there's a spiritual world. And I believe that there are people that can come into contact with that spiritual realm. I do believe that to be real. So even if someone says, I heard a voice, I'm not going to necessarily say you're a liar. Because maybe you did hear a voice. But what I'm going to tell you is that if the words that came out of that voice are not the words that are written in this book, it's not God's word. It's not God speaking to you. Amen. So be careful about it. I mean, just because you hear something that may be supernatural doesn't mean it's from God. There are supernatural beings that are evil and that are wicked. So just because something happens that's supernatural, don't put... And again, a lot of people put a lot of stock into that. I was talking to a lady once who was... She said, I always put my cruise control on a certain speed. It's always at, you know, 59 miles an hour, whatever it is. And she said, I forgot what it was that ha something happened. And she's like, was that you, God? And she said, it went up, like, <laughs> to a certain one and stayed there. And then she asked him again, and then, like, it went back down. Okay. Now, I'm not going to call that lady a liar. I don't know. I wasn't there. But the thing is, you can't just trust, is that you, God? Who knows what could be going on there? If I just assume that all of that happened the way she said, how do you know that that's God? How do you even know that? You don't know that. You're trusting that whatever experience you're having is of God just because... Who wants to think that that's the devil? Yeah. Nobody. Everyone wants to think God is with me, God's sitting next to me. Yeah. And, and it's comforting, right? I could understand why you'd want to think that, but you have to be able to separate these events and these emotions and be able to think about it logically and think about it in light of the Bible. Okay? It, it, this is where we have to get our source of information from. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to show you where this small, still voice comes from. Verse number 9 of 1 Kings 19 says, and this is talking about Moses, okay? Mo or, um, no, not, excuse me, not Moses. 1 <laughs> Kings is not Moses, Elijah. Verse number 9 says, And he came thither unto a cave, talking about Elijah, and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to, unto him, what doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. So God is literally walking by Elijah here. Elijah's in a, in a cave. And it says, and a great strong wind rent the mountains. That means it broke the mountains. A huge strong wind. And break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? 
This was God speaking to him. So the people are going to say, oh, well, there's, it's a still small voice. A still small voice is going to be God's voice. What I always like to ask these people would be, okay, so before you heard the voice, where was the wind? Where was the earthquake? Where was the fire at the presence of the Lord? Because when God makes an appearance, it's not just out of nowhere. He's all, I mean, think about Moses meeting with God on the mountain. The mountain was consumed with fire. I mean, there's, just a, you know, there's a burning bush. There's always something magnificent about God speaking with people. You know, I mean, it's not just this, if you heard a still, small voice, after all of these things, then he heard a still, small voice. And he was so afraid. I mean, he wrapped his face in his mountain. He's, you know, like, he's afraid to view God, as people always have been. When you are in the presence of the Lord, no matter how tough you think you are, no matter how strong or how bold you think you are, you're going to fall down on your face in, in the presence of the power of the Lord. And we get a very clear picture of that throughout the whole Bible of anybody who's been you know, in the presence of God where they've just been like falling down on their face as dead. And, and, and that's the type of reaction. So... Did all of that happen? These people say they heard God by a still small voice? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, the other point I would have is that, you know, the Bible says, um, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said. Now, if God is speaking to you directly in an audible voice, is that not the Word of God? And if that's the Word of God, should we just add another chapter to the Bible and say, you know, this is, this is the book of so-and-so, whoever he's talking to, and start writing down these words? I mean, if it's truly the Word of God, we ought to have it. Because we should, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. These people that God spoke to, that's why I was mentioning that earlier, the words that God spake unto them are in this book. That's why there is a book of 1 and 2 Samuel. That's why there are the five books of Moses. Because the words that God spake are here. We know what his words are. So if you're going to claim that God is speaking to you, hey, God's not going to tell you something that's different and special for you that doesn't apply to everybody else. These, you know, God's laws, God's rules, everything, that, God's instructions for us, it applies to everybody. God's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't make different rules for different people. This is the way it is. That's why there's, I mean, salvation is a perfect example. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, by Jesus Christ, he says. Jesus is the only way. It doesn't matter where you're born. It doesn't matter if you're born in some lost tribe in Africa. It doesn't matter if you're born in the Middle East and your parents are Muslim. It doesn't matter where you're born. The conditions are exactly the same. God doesn't change the rules for everyone. He says, look, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, it's the only way. Regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your situation, that is it. It's a free gift for everybody. It's not based on works. It's not based on anything else. You just have to receive it. But it's the same rules for everybody. I've had people, I've had, I've had this conversation as well. You know, the, the people always like to throw out, what about that man who's in some lost African tribe that no one has ever given him the gospel of Jesus. He's never even heard the name of Jesus. And he dies. Is God going to send that person to hell? Well, is there another way to get to heaven other than Jesus Christ? Now look, would that be a sad thing to happen if that were to happen? Absolutely. And people say, well, I don't see how that's fair. Well, God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. That's why we have missionaries. That's why people are sent out to go and do this. Because those people will die and go to hell. If they don't hear the name of Jesus. God doesn't give them some second chance. Now, it may sound nice. It may sound comforting to think that, oh, well, if someone were to live like that and then die, God's going to give them a second chance after they've died to receive Christ. And God's going to tell them about Christ. Who's going to reject Jesus after you've already died? <laughs> And, and think about this too. Think about the logic. Now, if that were the true, if that, if that were the case, that God would just, just, if no one ever heard about Jesus, you would have an opportunity after you died to receive Jesus because someone would tell you about Jesus somehow 
after you died. Well, wouldn't it seem like it would be better, or maybe that person would just not go to hell at all. Wouldn't it just be better to never mention Jesus ever, and we could all just forget and burn all the Bibles and just forget all about it? Because then, because then everybody, no, God could not send anyone to hell because we could all say we've never heard about Jesus. Like a, thinking along those lines, that would be the thing. That would be the, 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 maxim, the maximum soul saved would be by doing that. It makes no sense because God has already told us very clearly that, look, if you don't put your faith in Christ, you're not saved. And those who don't have Christ go to hell when they die. And again, is it a sad situation if something like that were to happen? Of course it is. But I always say too, you know, I don't even necessarily accept that theory that there is a person that exists like that because if you were to find that person, as soon as you find them, yeah. guess what? They've heard about Jesus. <laughs> like, that, the very, like, hey, have you ever heard about Jesus? If they say no, they've just heard about him. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you come up with these? You know, it's, it's, and, and there's these lost tribes and stuff, but we know about them. Like, they're not just lost. Like, like we know they exist. So I, I don't even accept that, that argument. But regardless, the Bible says what it says. Now, um, knowing God's will. Okay, so no, knowing God's will. Let's, how do we know what God's will is? Well, it's not as complicated as you might think. It's found in the page of this book. Okay, any commandment that we have, Every single commandment of God is God's will. That's what God wants you to do. That's why he made the commandment. He says, look, if I don't, you know, I don't want you to... Look at, if you would, in Ephesians chapter 5. There's a lot to look at. Ephesians chapter 5. When we obey God's commandments, we are keeping his will. Ephesians chapter 5. Do you want to know what God's will is in your life? What does God want me to do? Well, we'll start reading in verse number 3 of Ephesians chapter number 5. The Bible says, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint. Is this God's will? To not be even named among us? Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. God doesn't even want that named among us. Which means, should a, should a, should a person be fornicating? No. Should a person be in uncleanness? No. Should a person be covetous? No. That's not God's will. God's will is that we are not any of these things. It should not be named once among us. And, and, you know, this is important because a lot of people struggle with what is God's will in my life. Well, there's a lot. God's got a lot of, of wishes or wants for you in your life. And let's start with the very easy, clear ones because this is very clear. Verse number four, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting. Jesting is, you know, is joking around, um, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks for this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So those are all things that is God's will. He said, you know, not to be talking foolishly or jesting and fornication, all those things. Look at verse number 11. Jump down to verse number 11, Ephesians 5. It says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So you have these unfruitful works of darkness, these sins. He's not only is he saying, don't have fellowship with them, right? That's God's will. Don't have any fellowship with these unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Rebuke. Tell them they're wrong. You know, the, these, the, the wicked sins that people are doing, we need to be reproving that. We need to be reproving the sin and reproving the wickedness and the darkness. That it's not good enough just to not partake in them. We ought to be reproving them. It's God's will for your life. Verse number 17. Jump down to verse number 17 of Ephesians 5. The Bible reads, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Here we go. He's going to tell us. We don't want to be stupid. We don't want to be unwise. Let's understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says here, not to be drunk, um, but to be filled with the Spirit. And also, singing to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Like if you're not a person that likes to sing, this is God's will. He wants you to sing. He wants you to, to, to um, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your hearts, Lord. God wants to hear that. God likes the praise. This is what God wants. If you want to do what God wants, hey, start singing the hymns. Start singing the spiritual songs. Get that to be a part of your life. Let's keep reading. Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord, having that humble mind, esteeming others better than yourselves. Verse number 22, wives. Now specifically, he's going to break it down. We're still talking about what's the will of God. And he's going to break it down into some individual people. If you're a wife, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. This is God's will at, for a wife to submit yourself unto your husband. And he says, not only to submit yourself unto your husband, but as unto the Lord. As you would submit yourself unto the Lord, submit yourself unto your husband. Verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands, and everything. Now, husbands. So, okay, that was the wives. That was God's will for the wives. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, husbands, you need to be loving your wife. This is God's will for your life. You need to, to, to love your wife enough to be able to give your life for her and to die for her just like Christ did for the church. And it doesn't matter. Look, Christ died for sinners, for ungodly, for people who didn't deserve it. So even if you think, well, my wife doesn't deserve that kind of love, look, you're commanded from God to love your wife that much to be able to die for her. I don't care how much she does wrong to you. Think about how much you've done wrong to Jesus, yet he gave his life to save your soul. We ought to have as husbands that type of love for our wife, regardless of how she treats you. Now, it doesn't excuse what you do is wrong, but you, as, to be in God's will, need to love your wife with that much love that Jesus had for the church. It's a lot of love. We need to hold ourselves to a high standard. This is God's will for our life. If you're a wife, if you're a husband, we've seen these things. And um, I'm not going to keep finish reading the chapter, but um, in um, Colossians 3, you don't have to turn it, but it also says that children obey your parents. So you have husbands, you have wives, you have children. Children, you need to obey your parents. That's what God's will is for your life. He wants you to listen to obey your parents. That's what God has commanded you to do. You need to listen and respect them and obey them. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Just a little bit to the right in your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. It's right after the book of Colossians where we started. First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So he's saying here, you receive from us. This is Apostle Paul writing to the church of Thessalonica. He's writing the church saying, you received from us how you ought to walk, what the things you ought to do. Another reason why church and listening to preaching is important because the, the pastor is supposed to be delivering these things unto you from the word of God. Not of his own heart, but this is what Paul was doing. He's saying, we delivered this unto you. We're giving you God's messages and God's words and we're telling you, hey, look, this is how you ought to walk and to please God and you would abound more and more. Verse number two, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. You ought to be getting these commandments in church, but they're not coming directly from me. They're coming from God. It's from the Lord Jesus, right? That's why we read so much Bible. That's why we turn to so much scripture because we're getting the commandments of God. Look at verse number three. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification that ye should abstain from fornication. Again, we want to know what God's will is? 
Well, let's abstain from fornication. He says, um, your sanctification, sanctification is meaning you're set apart, you're, you're being made holy. That's what God's will is in your life, to be made holy, to be, to be, to be set apart from sin, to, be, to, to, to get all the sin out of your life. Look at uh, chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to see some other commands. This is, this is God's will in your life. Think about one will that Jesus Christ left. The last thing that he said was to preach the gospel to every creature. Right? That's God's will for our life. That's what God wants us to do. God wants you to, to, to share the truth and the love about Jesus. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse number 16. He says, rejoice evermore. That's a statement. That's a command. This is something that we need to be doing. Rejoice evermore. Verse 17. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. Don't have this bitter attitude that, that gets caught up on what you don't have and being disgruntled and thinking, oh man, I wish I had this or I wish I had that or why do I have to deal with this or that. Give thanks for everything. This is God's will. You want to know what God's will is in your life? Hey, we've gone through quite a few of them already. What does God want you to do? God wants you to be happy and content with what you have. That's God's will in your life. It says it in verse 18. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He says, quench not the spirit. When the spirit is trying to lead you in the truth and the spirit is trying to convict you of sin or whatever it is, don't quench that spirit and just, and just ignore it and put it away. Take heed to the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Don't get angry at the preacher. Don't get angry at the, the, the preaching of God's word. Don't despise them. They're here to help you. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Don't just accept everything that you hear. Prove them. Compare it to Scripture. And hold fast to the things that are good. Whatever is true and right. Hey, hold on to that. And then abstain from all appearance of evil. Even just looking like you're doing something wrong. This is God's will in your life. So when you're coming up, because we have decisions to make on a daily basis, on things that we can do, things that we can say, you know, places we can be. If you want to make sure you're in God's will, you think of, well, is it God's will? Because God's not willing that any should perish. Is it God's will for me to just walk in to the bar on a Friday night and start, and start preaching to people. Would that be God's will? If people start thinking, well, if I'm supposed to abstain and say, well, I'm not going to drink anything, but I need to abstain from all appearance of evil at the same time. Now look, is it important for souls to get saved? Yes, absolutely it is. But does that mean I should just put myself, what, what, yeah, you think, okay, well, what about a bar? Bar's not that bad. What about a strip club? Would it be okay for me to walk into a strip club and look, a bar is bad, okay? I'm not saying, I'm not condoning that, but just to make it a little bit more extreme, let's just say a strip club. You say, passive person, it would be okay for passive persons to walk into a strip club for the intent of giving the gospel to somebody. Would that be acceptable in God's eyes? Do you think God would be pleased with me going and do that? You say, well, you're doing a good thing. Yeah, but that's not appropriate. What would that do to my testimony if someone saw passive persons walking into a strip club? Why would anybody want to listen to a word? Oh, but I was, yeah, right. That's why I was, if, I, if a pastor was doing that, say, oh, yeah, well, I was just trying to share the gospel. Yeah, right. Sure you were. We need to, abstain. We need to, be, to be mindful of these things. And this, you know, that's a really extreme and almost a silly example, okay? But I use it to try to get a point across that we need to make decisions in our life in general. Now, it's not always going to be something that extreme, but we're always thinking, or you should be thinking, should I, is this okay for me to partake in? Is this something that's good to do? Especially, you know, you get invited to things from the world. Maybe you get invited to, to company parties or company picnics and things like that. And you say, okay, you, you need to be able to discern and decide, is God going to be pleased with this? Is this going to be God's will that I go and, and partake in this? Some people, I've had people ask me before, you know, I've got a family member that's that's Catholic and they're baptizing their baby, should I go and, and attend this event? Right? These are the types of things that are going to be more common. 
Because now you're starting to worry, wait a minute, is this, is this right? Should I do this? I love my family member. I don't want to offend them. But at the same time, you know, I believe when you're going to those events, you're showing your support for what they're doing. I don't think we should go and do that. Now, now make the decision on your own. Okay? But these are the things that, that I personally believe. And that's something that hits a lot more close to home because you're going to be thinking about these things. Well, wait a minute. What's right for me to do? We need to be able to look at the Bible and look at all of these verses, look at all of these commandments and keep them in mind, which is why it's so important for you to read the Bible on your own, by the way, so that you have them in your mind to be able to help you to make these right decisions to understand what the will of the Lord is. Is it God's will for you to go and, and do these things or be a part of these things? Even if you have good intentions, that's not always the right thing to do. We need to abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay? And there's very tactful ways to deal with a lot of these things as well. I mean, I've had friends where they've invited me. I say, you know, I appreciate you thinking about me to invite me to a big event in your life. But I don't believe that way. I don't think it's right. And, and you know what? Oftentimes it'll open up an opportunity to preach the gospel anyways. To, to kind of share the truth and say, you know what? I'm not trying to offend you, but these are my beliefs. I'm very strong and solid in my beliefs. And, um, you know, this is why I don't believe in that. It's a great opportunity to explain it. It's a great opportunity to bring up Christ, right? But I don't think we ought to just go and partake. I mean, and that's one thing. That's why the Bible talks a lot about like meat sacrificed unto idols and stuff. You say, look, it's just food. We know that the idol is nothing. We know that that false God doesn't even exist. It's not real. But other people are believing in this. You know, and, and you can't go and show your support of that when they're believing in that and you know just like as if it's not a big deal no you know these are the types of things that we need to understand um and be able to to know um from our own reading to make the right decisions now i'm going to go through i'm going to skip a few of these things a few other very common examples because there's major, but not just the little things. I mean, those, we have day-to-day -day decisions to make, but oftentimes, and what you ought to be doing is, is a common question for, is this God's will, is finding a spouse, right? Because that's a big decision to make. You're going to be spending the rest of your life with another person. And God-fearing people, people who love God, are going to be thinking, is this in God's will that I marry this person? Is this the right person? Well, one thing that's, that's pretty nice about God is he's given us a lot of freedom, excuse me, to, to choose what we want. You know, I don't, I'm not of the type that believes, you know, there is only one other soul that's out there that's just for you and that's it and there's only one other person that exists and you have to find that one right person. I don't believe that. I think that's been hyped up by music and movies and things like that. I don't think that's true because marriage... I mean, you ought to love you. Know, there's, there ought to be a lot of good reasons why you marry somebody. But marriage is not, it, it's not just a feeling. It's not just, oh, once you find that one person, everything's just going to be great forever and ever and ever and ever. Marriage is work. And there has to be a lot of work that goes in and effort. Um, it's not just some fuzzy feeling that's always going to be with you forever. Because and, and, then people start to think like, well, wait, maybe I married the wrong person. Because I'm not having this feeling anymore, whatever it may be. Let's look at some, at some things that God has outlined. What would be God's will for sp finding a spouse? Because he doesn't give us this idea of there's only one, other, one possible person that you need to marry and that's it. And if you don't find them, then you screwed up and too bad. It's not taught at all in, the, in Scripture. Very, there's a, a few requirements, but there are requirements that God gives. And we ought to heed them. Number one, are they a believer? Do they believe in Christ? Most important thing probably. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. A yoke. Think of what's a yoke. A yoke is that, is that equipment they put on the oxen to, to keep them together. Right? So if you're yoking up with someone, that's, I would think marriage is yoking up with somebody. I don't think it's unfair to make that parallel, that comparison of being yoked together with someone. You're binding yourself by, by a vow. By saying that you will be together until death do us part, right? That's the vow. So when you're yoking yourselves together, the Bible says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
You don't want to marry someone who's not a believer in Christ. It says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Number one, you need to make sure that your spouse or future spouse, if this is someone you're looking at, is saved. The Bible says the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. So basically, the Bible says, look, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been married and your husband's dead, your wife is dead, you know, in this case, it's her husband, Hey, she was bound by the law by, by making that vow to be married on him. But as soon as he dies, that's that's done. It's over. You're no, you're not continued. You don't continue to stay married to your to your spouse after they're dead. It's till death do us part. So he's saying, if you want to be married, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, whoever she wants to. It's her choice. And people try to say, oh, the Bible teaches, you know, it's so against women that, that they don't have a choice and there's all these arranged marriages and stuff. Now, did cultures have arranged marriages sometimes? Sure. But is that what the Bible's teaching? No, it says she's at liberty to be married to whom she will. It's her choice. Who does she want to get married to? And I don't want to get, there's so many scriptures that come to my mind now I could prove that beyond a shadow, but I don't want to get caught on that rabbit trail. She's at liberty to be married to whom she will. God says, look, marry who you want to marry. Only in the Lord. Make sure they're saved. Make sure they're, they're saved. Now, there, there's one other requirement that God puts on here, and that's if the person you're interested in has ever been divorced, or if you've ever been divorced and your ex is still alive. Because once you're, if you've been divorced but, you're, but your, spouse, your ex spouse has died, the, the, the laws, the, you're, not, you're not bound by that anymore. That's done. The Bible says in Luke 16, 18, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Jesus views that as adultery. Saying if you, if, you're, if you divorce someone else and then you marry someone, that's adultery. That's obviously not God's will to commit adultery. Okay? So these are the two requirements that if you're looking, what is God's will? If you're saying, say, man, but I really love this person. They love God. And, and, and we go great together, but if they've been divorced, that's not God's will. It's not. No matter how much you may feel like it is, no matter how much you feel connection and, and, and how strong those feelings may be for each other, if that's the case, it's not God's will. And see, we're getting our information from Scripture. This is how we determine what is God. What does God want for us? Going to church, Right? Is it God's will I go to this church or that church? Well, first of all, even going to church at all, the Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. A lot of people are just out of church altogether and that's a sin. You need to be able to find some kind of a church and get in and find the best one that you possibly can. But again, go to the Bible, use scripture. Are they preaching the right gospel? Are they preaching a false gospel? No, then that's not a legitimate church. You shouldn't be going there. Are they, pre you know, are they, they using the word of God? Are they using the King James Bible? Are they, you know, this is God's word? Okay, yes. You know, are they, and then are they out there doing the work? You know, Revelation 2 and 3 gives us a lot of criteria for churches where God says, you know, I'm going to take away your candlestick. And you can look at all the different things that they were doing. So these are the types of churches you probably don't want to get involved with if they're involved with all these various sins that these churches were committing. So you can use that as a guideline to, hey, let's try to find the right church, right? Um, I'm going to blow through a lot of these other ones too. You know, people have, have questions about, well, should I take this job or that job? Again, look at... Are you going to be asked to do things that are just completely contrary to God's word? Are you going to be asked to be breaking scripture, to be doing something sinful? If the answer is yes, then no. You should. I mean, I don't care how much they're paying you. I mean, you could say you, prostitutes could get paid all kinds of money. But that doesn't make it right. I mean, again, another extreme example, but break that down into some other things that you might be doing with your time. If, I, if I'm going to be spending my time, you know, serving booze. That's not right. I don't think that's going to please God at all. I don't think that's in God's will. Again, bartenders make a whole bunch of money. I've known bartenders who made lots and lots of money. But that's not right. You're feeding people poison. And you're, and you're, you're 
helping them to destroy themselves, to think bad thoughts, to do you know all the things that go along with alcohol. But um, you know, taking a job, moving to a new location, or moving for a job, moving to a new house. You know, people have questions about is this God's will for me to do this? Well, first of all, I'd say, you know, do you have a good church where you're at now, and is there a good church where you're moving to? Because I guarantee you, it's not going to be God's will for you to move somewhere where there is no good church for you to attend. This ought to be a priority in your life saying, well, I need to be around God's people. I need to be in a place where, where there are people who love the Lord because that's important for me in my life for just to help me to continue to grow and to stay right with God, to be involved in a group where the people love God. That should be number one on your list. Is, is it God's will for me to move to this state or so and so? Well, if there's a good church there, if you know, if you, if you know that it's okay, then, then fine. If that's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with that. But I would make sure, you know, if you're going to say, well, you know, I'm going to get paid a lot more by moving this place, but there's no good church there. I don't think that's going to be God's will because God doesn't care about the money as much as we do, for sure. God doesn't care about the money at all. We tend to put a lot of emphasis on the money when the money literally means nothing. Mm -hmm. And the more we can just have that mindset and attitude about the money, the more happy we'll be and the less poor decisions we'll make. You say, what's really important is people and, and doing things for others, not how much money can you make for yourself. Now, um, the, last, the last subject I wanna, I wanna touch on here is regarding preachers and preaching. Because I've heard time and time again these stories of people who are called to preach. Sit down. They say, I've been called to preach from God. And they say, well, if you've been called to preach, and they, they make a big emphasis on this calling to preach, and it's called to preach. And, and, and it, I mean, it makes me wonder, like, is, am I doing what's right in God's eyes? Is this God's will for me to be a preacher? And oftentimes, you know, it's easier to look at someone else and to come up like I'm doing this morning. We got the Bible. We got these, you know, these instructions. It's real simple. When it turns around on you, then you start making things more complicated. But this is how I settled the matter, just, just with myself. I would say, God, this is what I'm planning on doing. This is honestly what I did. I said, if, if this is something you really don't want me to do, make it impossible for me to do it. I mean, I don't care, like, like take my finances away because I, I was going to have to buy a house. You know, There's a lot of things that had to come into place in order for me to start a church here. There's a lot. So I said, just make it impossible for me. But here's what I see, God, because I'll be honest, here's what I see from the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. You said it's a good thing to want to be a preacher, to want to be a pastor, to want to be a bishop. That's a good thing. I don't see that. And then, and then he lists off all the qualifications. I say, God, here's the qualifications that you, you laid out for being a pastor. I am not in violation of any of those. I have the support of my pastor. He believes that, that I fit all the, the bill for this and, and, is, and is willing to send me out. So, so I don't think there's anything that disqualifies me from being a pastor. So why would it not be in God's will to preach the word of God, to get an assembly, to get people, to, you know, and to do this great work for God? It doesn't make any sense. But you say, you know, a lot of pastors say, well, I've had this experience, you know, I was at home and I, you know, I just had this moment and I knew God was calling me to preach and stuff. <laughs> Look, I never had that moment, okay? But I don't think I am any bit outside of God's will more than anyone that claims to have had a moment like that, okay? I don't think we need to wait for, for some type of supernatural experience, to, to tell us that we're in God's will. If you could read it in Scripture, if you know it's the right thing to do, that's God's will for your life. Okay? He wants you to do that. He gives us choices. Now look, I know not everybody is a pastor. Not everybody is a deacon. Not everyone's a teacher. Not, you know, everybody has a different function and role to play that God has kind of given you different skills and abilities to do certain jobs. Not everybody is going to be able to be a pastor. For one, because they're not, they may not even fit the qualifications, but just in general, I mean, we, we have different abilities and different skills that God has given to us. What we need to do is make sure we're using those skills and those abilities to, to, for God's glory. 
That is God's will. And we have the instruction. We know what God wants us to do. We know God wants us to preach the gospel every creature. I'll see in... Um, I'll read from you. You don't have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. That's where we're going to finish to this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You have the book of Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, okay? I'm going to read for you from Numbers chapter 11. This is when Moses, um, the 70 elders were called together. In uh, Numbers 11, I'll start reading in verse 25. It says, And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him, talking about upon Moses, and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other, Medad. And the spirit rested upon them and they were of them that were written but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So God tells Moses, you know, bring these elders to the tabernacle. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to anoint them with my spirit, and they're going to prophesy as well. It's not just going to be Moses. So he says, great, you know, he, he brings them out there, but two of the guys stay behind. They don't go for whatever reason. But God's spirit still is poured upon them. So they're in the camp. Like, while well, the other guys are all prophesying by the tabernacle, these guys are prophesying in the camp. They stayed back. And it says in verse 27, there ran a young man and told Moses. So this guy tells Moses, look, he says, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men, answered and said, my Lord Moses, forbid them. So Joshua hears this. He's like, oh, they didn't come out here. They didn't come and, and they weren't where they were supposed to be. And now they're prophesying there. They forbid them to do that because they didn't come. Basically is what he's saying. But look at Moses' response. He says, And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? He said, You worried about what they're doing because of me? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? God say, Moses is saying, Look, they're preaching, they're prophesying God's word. Amen to that. Would to God that all of God's people were preaching his word. That's the way Moses, okay, saying, the more the merrier. If you're going to be preaching God's word, then amen, let's get more people to do it. Would God all, all, all the Lord's people were prophets? That's the way Moses looked at it. I think that's the right way to look at it. Um, God's going to be happy with a man who fits the bill that decides to, to devote his life to, to serving the Lord and doing what they know is right from his word and preaching his word and truth. Now, Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the, la the last chapter and the last verses of Ecclesiastes. Because the whole point of the sermon, I was trying to demystify this concept of God's will for your life. Because it's not that difficult. It's just a matter of knowing the Bible and reading the Bible for yourself. Looking at the clear instructions and saying, this is what God's telling me to do. This is what God's telling me not to do. That's God's will. That's it. That's God's will. Ecclesiastes 12, the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, the last verse, he wraps up the book of Ecclesiastes with verses 13 and 14 saying, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God keep his commandments. That's God's will. That's what he wants you to do with your life. So that's it. Fear God, keep his commandments. Don't worry about trying uh, having some supernatural experiences and feelings to tell you what God's will is. Let's just keep his commandments. They're written in the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instructions that you've given us through your word. God, I pray that you would please Help us all to, to not make foolish decisions or, or to, to avoid doing the right thing because we're waiting for some kind of verification or validation from you, dear Lord. Um, we know we can see the things that you've told us to do and you've told us not to do. Lord, help us just to be um, strengthened and encouraged that that is your will and that we know that that's your will. And that everyone here would, would be able to make proper decisions based on the, the clear statements that you've already told us from the Bible. And um, Lord, we love you. And we all, I, I know here, I can speak for probably just about everybody, that we all have a desire to, to walk closer according to your will, dear Lord. 
Help us all to understand what that is more and more since we have the mind of Christ. Help us to understand the mind of Christ that much more since we have the, the words that will give us that knowledge. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.